in today's age, it's a requirement. If you want to be the best at what you do in any arena, like you have to create content. This is how it is in 2024. So you have skin in the game with your client. And if it's performance based, it's just an implied guarantee in a sense to where that you don't get paid until they make more money first. Just watch what happens when you give away some of your best stuff for free. At the end of the day, you're trying to bring people into your ecosystem. And if they don't buy now, or if you have a long wait list, they're still in that ecosystem. They're learning from you. You're giving them a shit ton of free value. Before we start this podcast, I have one little favor to ask you. Can you please hit the subscribe button down below so we can help more people every single week? Thank you. All right, man, let's kick off. So where I want to start, right, is you've hit some pretty big numbers, which I think if anyone is familiar with you, they know they know the numbers, right? But for some people, you know, you've done over 2 billion organic views. Um, you're guaranteeing up to 150 million views within 90 days for a lot of the clients you work with. But before we get into the tactics and techniques, I want to get your perspective on like the short form agency space right now, especially on like Instagram and TikTok. Yeah, definitely. And we're just shy under 3 billion views now. So we're tracking to reach over 500 million views this month across all of our clients for the month of March, 2024. And then company mission is for us to be at 1 billion views per month by June of this year. I think we're tracking to do so. Then we'll push it to 2 billion, then 5 billion, then 10 billion, just to keep it going. Um, but with short form content in the agency space, I would say it, there's a lot more freelancers than agencies. You know, it's, it's a lot of like solopreneurs and freelancers who are looking to get started. Um, for anyone out there who's already creating content, you probably know you get just flooded with DMs and emails of people selling videos and like, Hey, I can create short form video for you, et cetera. Um, on a daily basis, I don't even have, uh, an extremely large following yet. My personal brand is still newer. I'm still receiving, give or take like five on average DMs per day coming in of people, you know, trying to sell short form content when that's what we do as well. So there's no research of like their DMs and outreach either, uh, backing it up. I usually just like, uh, refer them to our editor application page. It's like, Hey, we're always hiring editors to work with, with us and our, our clients. Um, so my thoughts on the space are there's a lot of people in it, but there's still massive opportunity. Um, at our company, Media Scaling, we've barely scratched the surface. And the biggest thing is you have to differentiate yourself and break through the noise by having an amazing offer and results to back it up. So that's what we've done. I mean, we're still a newer company. We launched um, just over 12 months ago. We're coming up on month 13 with the company. We're already at 90 plus employees. Uh, we've generated billions of views. We've worked with a lot of top brands in the space. And the way we've been able to do that is one, we've been doing this for a while. I have now over eight years of experience working with larger brands in the social media space, my partner as well. Uh, but secondly, is because we crafted an undeniable offer. You know, We're guaranteeing up to 150 million views in 90 days. So that breaks through the noise. There's not a lot of people doing that. Most people in this space, they sell edits, we sell results. You know, And we back it up with a massive guarantee. 100%, man, my brain is firing with this now. And this was the whole genesis of like my company too, right? It was like, we focus on outcome, not output. So it was all to do, because the reason why is because podcasts don't grow, right? You, you see this yourself, right? You go on YouTube, a lot of the smaller channels, they don't grow on YouTube, they don't grow on audio, just fuck all SEO. So that's what we were focusing on in the beginning. Now, not 150 million of, a, of, a, of, a, of views of engagement as a guarantee, but that small shift in people's minds knew that we were focused on outcome versus output. And now there's a ton of stuff to get into there from those different aspects. Now, you said you're you're up to 90 employees. I remember watching a Brett episode recently and you had 49 employees at, at that point. How how have you been able to grow this from the genesis, right? From the early stage to, to where you're at now? Because it seems like you're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, we're projecting to be at 150 over the course of the next three, four months uh, with our current client wait lists and all the onboards that we have planted in the pipeline. A big part of why we have the team size that we have is because with our offer to break down how it works, uh, we will work with content creators who already have a decent sized content database for us to go off of to where we then plug in essentially a media division of editors, social media managers, team lead, copywriter, clips coordinator, thumbnail designer, data analyst, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of team involved in being able to fulfill on our service. Um, so to give perspective, like the first client that we signed as part of media scaling, we had to hire a team of about 12 to 13 people to fulfill on it. Um, and a lot of our client contracts have a team uh, of all the ancillary positions and then even full-time dedicated positions, anywhere between like eight to 16 people 
per client contract on our larger done for you services. So it just requires a lot of manpower. Uh, AI is not there yet to just be able to do what we do. Uh, it's night and day difference as far as the quality of having just amazing people. So to answer your initial question on how we've grown the way we have, I mean, again, the, just the nature of our fulfillment requires us to have a large team and a lot of people um, to fulfill on our services. But also, it's it's just great systems and a uh, great team. Like We have a, an extremely strong culture. We're clear in our core values. We have an, an amazing mission that's extremely exciting to be a part of. You know, We're going to be the number one agency in the creator economy, which is currently valued at over $400 billion of a market cap projected to grow to more than 1 trillion by 2032. It's growing by over 20% year over year, like massive opportunity. I saw a stat, there's over 240 million creators and it's only getting larger. There's still on a consistent basis, so many people who are doing incredible things and they're amazing at whatever it is their passion is about. And they're not creating content yet. And they know that they need to start. Like it's not really even an option in today's age, it's a requirement. If you want to be the best at what you do, in any arena, like you have to create content. It's just, that's just how it is in 2024. Uh, so the, the opportunity is massive. Um, and then we have amazing leadership in place as well. It's been uh, a big takeaway and recent learning experience for me is just uh, bringing in people who have decades of experience building different divisions and company for operations and for marketing, for sales, for client service, for finance. Uh, just placing directors and leaders to come in and take ownership over that division um, and bring in amazing talent that you lean on. And uh, so we're really focused on building out our executive team now and just systemizing things, operationalizing things, keeping a really strong culture um, and just having amazing people on the boat to take us to that next level of where we're looking to go. It's crazy, man. You have like an enterprise view already and you've only been a year into it so far, right? The way you're kind of viewing the business. So how is it growing from like a revenue perspective? Last time I checked, it was at like just over seven figures. Where are you kind of currently at? We're, we're scaling fast, you know, um, with the wait list, we do have a wait list. It is generally floating between two to three months of our done for you services. We also have coaching that we provide to people, which there's no wait list, just a part of, um, you can join anytime, but, uh, because of, the amount of people involved and moving pieces involved with their operations is why we have that wait list. Our calendars are full. Uh, demand is high. It's, it's a blessing, right? Um, and so the wait list also helps us from projections of just the income statement, uh, a better understanding where we're going to be next month, the month after, the month after that. But our run rate is looking good. You know, we're at multiple seven figures. I think we can hit an eight figure run rate this year with the amount of growth that we're experiencing. Uh, and doing everything we can to make that happen. So we'll see. Man, that is absolutely insane. So we, we can get into those details too, in terms of like how you craft the offer. So you, so you, I'll go went through your, your sales process. I went through the vir virality guide, which we're going to go through soon as well, which was like super helpful, man. It was a great resource. So for anyone that, that's from not familiar with it, uh, Logan has basically like these frameworks, these tools, it's almost like a mini course that anyone can go through. And it's breaking down the best hooks, the best clips that you basically have. And it's incredibly valuable. But for you growing up, growing to that stage, that stage, do a lot of these creators, people like Gregor Gallagher, Brandon Carter, a few other kind of big boys, do they pay you on like a retainer or is it like performance based? Yeah, it's a mix of both. You know, in the agency space, if you can work out some level of a win-win structure and make it more performance based, that's where you can also have incredible opportunity on the back end. Uh, because one, you align incentives. So you have skin in the game with your client. And if it's performance based, uh, it's just an implied guarantee in a sense to where that you don't get paid more upside until they make more money first, right? And so the more you can get creative with win-win structures in that arena and have upside, the better it's going to be. Um, so it depends on the package that we're providing and with each of our clients, the way that they're monetizing and just overall what their socials and what their business looks like. We're always uh, you know, looking to just get creative and, and create the best win-win structure but also do it in a way that's scalable and that gives us the margin to where it makes business sense and uh, we can continue to scale our operations, right? And then the other thing that you touched on that I think is important to note, a lot of people ask, like when it comes to conversion strategies from your organic content and your socials, what is the best way to take all of this views, all the reach that you're getting and turn that into leads and then sales? Uh, one of the best ways we find is having incredible, amazing, 
free lead magnets, free offers, right? So ours is 2 billion view secrets. Um, like you mentioned, it's a free mini course and we truly put like some of our best stuff in there. Uh, you can get access at mediascaling.com forward slash secrets. And uh, it has hundreds of our viral hook frameworks that have proven to work incredibly well. We included our scheduler that we use to post over 14,000 times a month, to keep top notch quality. We have multiple training materials in there. It's like, and again, it truly is some of our best stuff. I think a lot of people make the mistake when they have a free lead magnet, they just don't, and they don't make it valuable enough. Like if you include your best things in, in your, what you offer for free, people just automatically assume like, holy shit, if I'm getting this amount of value for free, I can't imagine what their paid content and what their paid services and programs would, would look like. Right. So it creates this uh, way higher throughput uh, retention and it's just a better look on your brand. So, so many people, they're just lazy with the lead magnet that they create, um, or they just are trying to hold back their best stuff and just afraid to give it away for free. Something that I learned from Hermosi and some other people in the space is like, just, just watch what happens when you give away some of your best stuff for free of how much more money you'll make on the back end. Um, so also when you have a free lead magnet, you can use that to push and promote more on the front end of your socials without necessarily coming across as salesy or promoting, right? If you're always just pushing your core, like paid offer or service, um, versus if on the front end, you're marketing like, Hey, I have these amazing free resources for you. It's just, it comes across as better, uh, and as far as a branding perspective, um, for your socials, right. And it's more effective More people are willing to off sign up for free, build more of that trust, uh, in a relationship with you before they send to your paid services and offers. Yeah, man. I love that because at the end of the day, you're trying to bring people into your ecosystem. And if they don't buy now, or if you have a long wait list, they're still in that ecosystem. They're learning from you. You're giving them a shit ton of free, free value. And it's just way more, I guess, like authentic than like book a call, book a call, book a call. Like, like people don't want to hop on calls. They want to be able to learn from you. And that's basically what you're effectively doing. And yeah, man, like it's pretty, it's pretty insane the amount of free co content you're putting out as well as what you're offering then in the program, right? Because it's like an elevation up. Now let's get into those tactics. So some people are not, are not familiar with this for you, right? So you are basically running a ton of these multiple accounts for big names, big creators, big entrepreneurs, and giving them so much more opportunity to, to pop off. So can you walk me through where you even got the idea to create the multiple accounts and like how effective it's been. We frame it as the Andrew Tate strategy, right? But we do it in-house for quality control and predictable scale. But um, Andrew Tate really did pioneer this. He did it in a little bit of a different methodology by using an army of affiliates through his uh, paid program called The Real World. And that worked extremely well for him. Um, I think for a few reasons. One is he's incredibly polarizing one of the most polarizing people on the internet. And that gets views. It gets uh, watch time and retention. So a lot of people were able to create accounts, start posting his content and get millions of views and therefore start making money right away. Uh, versus uh, what we've seen, uh, we just connected with a lot of people at this point who had tried to go the affiliate model approach and it just doesn't work for them. Um, I, I know very few people, if, or honestly at all, that has made this work consistently and sustainably for them with only using affiliates outside of Andrew Tate. Um, another, like a few big names in the space are like Luke Belmar, uh, Iman Godzi. They both do this internally. And that that's what makes it uh, sustainable. That's what makes it scalable. That's what makes it predictable and ongoing. There's a, a huge graveyard of Discord communities and secondary accounts of people who have tried to do this through an affiliate model. And it just doesn't work because it's usually people overseas and then younger kids they create accounts, they post content for one week, two weeks, and they don't get results. They don't get any sales. They don't make any money and they give up. Right. And then it's just the turn and burn cycle. And it's very, very rare for people to stick with it long enough to see success at a level of scale like Andrew Tate did, but he really did pioneer the strategy. And then my partner, Spencer Murphy, um, he worked internally with Iman Kazi and, uh, Iman hired him to build a full secondary account network. They came together and just said like, Hey, I'm looking to build the Andrew Tate strategy in house. So Spencer prior to working with Iman had been the uh, chief of marketing for Jason Capital for, I believe around six years or so started with Jason Capital when he had uh, little to no following and then grew it over the course of that uh, stint of working with him to more than 6 million collective followers. They had done a lot organically, um, had done a lot of organic page strata strategies and 
things along those lines, like built full content systems, had a full media division, a lot of editors. So he was able to take that experience and all the systems that he had and then applied it to Iman uh, when he was working with him and just took it to the next level of scale. And within the first four months, they generated 449 million views. Um, after building this secondary account network strategy, if you go to a social play, there's a direct correlation of when the secondary accounts went live. It was in July of 2022. You look at his main YouTube channel in the growth, it's like July of 2022. It was an inflection point to where it just exponentially catapulted. Um, his YouTube channel went from 340,000 subscribers to 3.5 million subscribers in one year. And a huge piece of that was this full network of secondary accounts, right? So it just tapped into massive growth. Um, Spencer really led that division for Iman and worked internally for him for, I believe, around 10 or 11 months. And then I was in a transitionary phase. Um, so me and Spencer have grown up together. We've known each other since we were like nine years old, been best friends for a long time. And uh, so he was staying with me, telling me about what they were accomplishing. He was kind of getting on the itch to go back out on his own. Um, and I was in a transition phase to where we just, we had the idea, partnered together, started media scaling, decided to go for the top um, and offer this with a huge guarantee behind it to the most established creators who already had large followings, large brands, and a huge content database to where we knew this would be extremely effective for getting, uh, getting started from day one. That's what we did. And then, you know, we broke through the noise. We had an offer for the top of the market that just resonated well. We had the results in the systems to back it up. Uh, and then also backed it up with the massive guarantee, which if we didn't know what we were doing, that would have posed major risk to us. But, uh, we had the systems and we fulfilled in our guarantee and done so with every client that we worked with, um, to where it's, it's been an awesome journey. It's worked really well. Man, you know what's super interesting from there? That's actually, it's a wild story, but it's a fact that you've out the gates went for the top 1% of people or the top 0.1% of people, right? And I'm interested to learn like how you got that first client after Iman, because I know Iman was internal to some degree. Because from my perspective, like, or let's say like, pull out from the scenario. If someone messaged me saying, I'll get you 150 million views like today, but it was like a brand new account or a new individual. And this person already gets millions of messages anyway, to begin with, like trying to break through that noise is kind of tough, right? So when you went, when you decided like, okay, this is our ICP, we're going to go for them. How did you actually even get them into that sales process? Because what, what I've even found, right, is that we were creator focused for podcasts, but then I realized that, mm, we didn't really want to work with like new creators or like beginner creators. And that's when we moved into B2B because B2B basically is better contracts, longer contracts. Um, and it's like more like predictable revenue. Basically as a result, we're able to get a bigger revenue, bigger clients. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because at the same time, you know, shiny penny syndrome will pop up. Some other person will want to pay you 60K, right? And you're like, oh, maybe I'll take it. But it falls outside of the ICP range. So walk me through that process as, as you got those first couple of clients in the early days. Yeah, great question. So like I mentioned, I had already been in this space for um, now over eight years prior. Same thing with Spencer. We're both the same age. And so we had connections. What did you, by the way? Uh, 26. Spencer as well. What the fuck have you been doing this since you're 18? Got started early. You know, we grew up in the generation to where it's like when you're still in high school, you're watching uh, people on social media teach you how to make money. And so when I was in high school is when I started investing inside of courses and programs. Uh, it, it all started with an ad saying how to rank web pages on Google and then sell them to local businesses. They'll pay you $2,000 a month, passive income, and you'll be a millionaire in, in 90 days, you know, type of thing. Um, so that's what got me started and did that for uh, years. Uh, a lot of failed attempts and, and just was buying programs through the process, like still working as a server in high school. Uh, I mowed a lot of lawns, um, had like a, a mini landscaping hustle, if you will, in high school to make money as well, which was paying for these courses to where I was making no money. Um, but I learned, you know, investing in programs for SEO and then for drop shipping and building Shopify stores, landing pages, running ads, like email marketing. So the more of these programs you best you invest in, you just start to stack skills like one after the other after the other. And there's like the first program that you invest in is probably not going to be the one that makes you a huge amount of money, right? But if you continue down that path and you continue to stack skills, watch what happens over the course of the next three, four years, if even shorter. Um, so that's the process that I followed and had a lot of failures before starting to finally have a lot of success. 
uh, and just continue to invest in myself, uh, join different masterminds, online marketing communities, and through that space, got connected with more and more people. You know, when you're earlier on, you and your friends and people the same age who follow this process as well, start to see more and more success and your network just naturally grows as a result of just time in the game, right? So that also plays a big role in this and you'll start to get connected with more people over time. So um, when we started media scaling, our first client was actually through a referral. Uh, our first client was Grego Gallagher. And uh, we were connected through a referral since we are, were already in the space. Um, and for the first almost nine months of the company, we grew about 50% from referrals and word of mouth and the other 50% from cold email outreach. And I have a lot of experience like building cold email outreach systems. Um, so we put together what we called our dream 1000 list. And we just mapped out all the names who fit the client criteria of people who had a million plus collective followers, uh, were making 3 million plus in annual revenue, 50 plus hours of content and continuing to create content ongoing. Right. And so we had people on there like Tony Robbins and Grant Cardone and Rob Deerdeck and so on and so forth, right? And just had our dream 1000 list. Then we'd have a VA go and find all their emails. It's great. You can find anyone's email. Uh, you know, just go on Upwork and look at like Data Scraper or List Scraper. Um, and you'll be able to find anyone's email. And then we put together really highly personalized email campaigns as well. So many people, they just want to shortcut it and automate it and like put it into a CRM or an email automation uh, tool and then just put people into a list and feed it. And there's a time and place for that if you have a big market. But we had a list of... It, it really got to like 300 people and that's it. Um, so I looked at every email that we sent out as a silver bullet, right? And so instead of taking a very automated approach, I went the other side and made it very manual, uh, manual and personalized. And at the early days of starting the company, I was the one who were, was sending the emails. And I would go and actually type out specific data. Like we would run an audit on people's socials and be like, this is the amount of views you've gotten in the past 30 days. This is what we're guaranteeing you. It's you're going to see this percentage of growth. We would include like little notes as well. Uh, if we knew their brand, like brand idioms and sayings they did, or if they were just on a trip, like hope you had a great trip. So they knew this was a legit person who took a lot of time uh, and researched their brand. And we we're communicating and knew their numbers better than they did, you know, of like the audits that we would do. So that's also something that breaks through the noise. Um, and then our guarantee was so strong and big to back it up that we got a lot of responses of people who, like I mentioned, have millions of followers. They get solicited constantly and they'd be like, man, I get, you know, a hundred emails a day. I never respond to any, but this is interesting. Let's talk, you know, cause we just, we took the time to craft an amazing offer, uh, and then really personalize our outreach, just communicate how we can truly add value to them. Uh, and then was meticulous in that process. And we didn't just send one email, we followed up, but we followed up in a value driven way. Also a big mistake. So many people make is when you're following up is you just do it in an annoying way. You're like, Hey, bumping this up. You know, did you see this? Just check it in. <laughs> I like, fucking hate yeah, that. <laughs> don't do that. You know, to like be valuable when you follow up. So like showcase how you can add value to them, you know, like do free work for them, send a free video. Um, you can showcase case studies, like report on things that you're seeing work really well, like strategies, give them systems, just give them stuff. Um, follow up with value. Don't be annoying. And you can do a lot with cold email if you do it right. Do you want to launch a podcast for your business, but you don't know where to start? Remove the stress, pressure, and all the overwhelm that comes with it by working with Podcast University. If you're an ambitious individual who wants to build your influence online, grow your own podcast, and also stand out from the crowd, Podcast University is for you. We help you with the strategy, equipment, the content, your guests, everything you need to create a top tier podcast. If you want to learn more, check out Podcast University and start your podcast journey today. I love that, man. That's basically how we built this all was straight from cold email referrals. Because what was so nice, similar to you, right, is that we could do a Loom video and be like, hey, like you're getting seven views in a podcast, you're getting 14 views in a podcast. If you just change these four different components, 
Like you're going to like triple or fucking 10 X your growth already. And then people will say, okay, like, you know, they can either go and do it. We give them so much information that they can go do it themselves. Or mm -hmm. if they're like, okay, fuck that. You can go do it for us. And that's always what comes down to, right? It's a time, it's a time factor. That's why B2B actually is very interesting for that because B2B is more to do with time than to do with anything else. Whereas some creators can just be like, oh, like I'll figure it out or whatever. So man, this is super, super interesting. So when you started building out the systems, and let's get into even how you built that, right? I thought, so you're releasing like 30,000 clips of a month or even more at this stage. I, I would have assumed that it was automated. And I would have assumed that even your creation of the clips were automated. And I actually interviewed Luke Belmer in Singapore and he was telling me that he was like, we, re we release a clip every 60 seconds. And the first thing that went off in my head was, oh, we have this automated tool that he just built basically some SaaS tool. Uh, but then I found out afterwards, it wasn't. And he's trying to bring it down to 15 seconds. So talk me through that philosophy as to why you went manual and how, how do you even build those systems in the back end when across 100 employees? You know, AI and automations will be there at some point, I'm sure, but it's not there yet, right? So if you're going to get top level results and generate tens, hundreds of millions of views per month, like you need to have a great team and great people to back it up currently in 2024, at least in March of 2024. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of exciting things this year. Uh, in the space of AI and new tech. And, you know, we already have seen massive acceleration over the course of the past year and a half, two years specifically. Um, so when it comes to the systems and not automating it, it's because we see much better results. You know, there's a lot of softwares out there that market like, hey, upload your long form video and our AI will clip it up and edit it for you. And you don't have to do any work. Like Opus Clips is the leading one. And we're keeping our eye on that. Like we test it when new updates come out. We'll test it again, like see how it is, but it's still a nine day difference uh, of having an amazing editor um, who has been trained and really knows what they're doing. Uh, and we now have over 40 editors in the company. I don't know the exact number, maybe closer to 50. Um, a lot of them have done tens to even hundreds of millions of views with us in uh, 12 months or less, many of which are from brand new secondary accounts, which makes it more impressive. Um, so I say this because our edits are really, really good. We train with our team on a daily basis. We have our own internal editor training, which we also offer as part of our coaching program as well. Uh, we teach people how they can go out and recruit their own editors, their own social media managers. And then we provide our own internal trainings and ongoing training with our management uh, to get them up to par and implement our systems. Um, but when you have amazing systems in place, trainings in place, really good hiring processes to vet and bring in the, the great talent, and then a culture and a leadership team to back it up and cultivate and grow that talent and make sure that they want to stay with you and grow with you for the long term, um, it produces amazing results. Yeah. And then we just have really good systems to back it up. So it really is just all people and systems. Um, and I will say as well, our clients make our job easier. You know, a lot of our clients, they're amazing at what they do. They create incredible content and we just help maximize it. Like the problem that we identified with media scaling is majority of content creators are generating a fraction of the reach they could from their organic content. So what we do is come in and unlock the reach that they're missing out on. And usually it's to a massive degree. You know, we'll many times in the first 90 days, we'll anywhere from on the lower end, like 3X on the, on the highest end, 30X plus um, people's growth in total views within 90 days. And then the longer we run this, the more, uh, the bigger it becomes, the more exponential the growth becomes. Um, so it only gets greater and greater. So, and we just do that by repurposing so much more of their content and, and just flooding socials uh, with their content. Man, that's super interesting. So putting on my devil advocate hat or someone's approach to this will say, well, this wouldn't work for me, right? That's what they would say, right? They'd say, this only works for the big boys. What do you say to people when they say, oh, like, will this work for me or will it only work for Iman and Luke Bomer? Um, for a lot of people, it won't work. Um, you need, the biggest thing that you need is a larger content database before you start to create a full network of all these secondary accounts uh, that distribute your content as well. Like to give you perspective, we're posting... Uh, 1,800 to 4,200 times per month per client. And we turn through a lot of content quickly when we're doing volume like that, right? So you do need a big database and then you also need to be creating content ongoing. But if you don't check those boxes yet, it really doesn't need to take long to get there either. Like you can do it right and you can build a large enough database to really get this running within three months um, if you're committed to it and you're ongoing on a weekly basis creating new content. So that's the biggest factor 
Uh, but there's a lot of things that you need to get right before you really scale up and before you're going to be doing, you know, 100 million plus views per month, like many of our top clients have. Um, and so you need to have the production quality correct. You need to have a clear brand identity. You need to have expertise to back it up if you're knowledge based or if you're more of like an entertainer, influencer, or creator base. You need to just know how to provide value in your content. I look at value from two pillars, entertainment and information. And then you can combine both together, right? But if you're providing value in one of those two ways, um, then that's what is necessary. Um, so you have to provide value. You have to have a clear brand identity. In our 2 billion view secrets program I mentioned, we also have an incredible brand identity worksheet that just prompts the questions to ask, such as who are you? What is your brand? What do you stand for? Um, who is your client avatar? What are their pain points? What are their motivations? What are their desires? Do you have slogans? Do you have what are your values and beliefs that you stand for that you market in your content? All these things really matter. And you need to think through it. And your own personal brand, you have to incorporate and build just like you would with a company when you put together the branding guidelines, your core values, your mission, your vision. Like do the same thing for your own personal brand as well. Treat it in the same way. Um, and that makes a big factor in difference. Then you need to have the right content strategy. And you need to, very importantly, remove friction from the process. That's a huge mistake I see a lot of people make is they um, want to get started creating content for their brand. And they do so in a way to where there's just a lot of friction. Like maybe they don't enjoy the type of content they're creating or there's a lot of moving pieces and they need to, they feel like they have to go to a different location every time and work with a videographer and do all these different components. And it just feels like a hassle. Um, and therefore it's not going to be sustainable for them versus we teach you how to, like we can help people whether they're just getting started or they already have millions and millions of followers and everyone in between. So if you're just getting started, we, my recommendation is set up a filming studio. Production quality does matter. Outside of TikTok, TikTok, you can do well, just like selfie style phone content, but it's harder to batch and systemize that. Um, on the other platforms, production really matters. So good video, good audio, good lighting, so on and so forth. Um, so create a studio uh, have good production qu quality content. We can teach you how to do that with a budget of $250 up to $3,000, depending on what level of equipment you want to get. So it doesn't take a lot of money. Um, and then you want to have a clear content strategy behind it. What I find for a lot of people, they just, they don't like talking to a camera. Like I, I speak at events. I just spoke at a, a mastermind this past Friday. And I was like, Hey, who here has created content and talked to a camera before? half the room raised their hand. I'm like, who likes creating content and talking to a camera? Like everyone lowers their hand. Like it, it sucks. Talking to a camera sucks versus everyone likes talking to a person. Right. And so, um, something that resonates to a lot of people that I found to be really helpful is what we call a mock podcast. So whether it's, you can have a family member, a friend, a team member, an employee, just someone who you have rapport with, they sit down and before you schedule the, the filming session, just spend 10, 15 minutes to map out a lot of questions that your client avatar and the people that you're creating content for are going to resonate with. And then have whoever is doing the mock podcast with you, just ask you questions and make it a conversation. And you don't have to talk to the camera, talk to them directly and just have the camera angled at you slightly. That way you're getting it on content. Um, and that is something that I found to where everyone enjoys answering questions and talking about themselves and they enjoy talking to people who they like um, and just put a camera there and you still become much more comfortable. It helps get around like that camera shock. Um, it helps get around like the time of people getting more comfortable behind being on camera because it is different when you do that, right? Um, there's, there's just a skill set that's built uh, as part of that process. But these are all different things that you can do to, again, remove friction, like make it something that's going to be long-term sustainable for you to, to be the best in the content creation space, you have to be long for long term committed. Like all the top people, they go into this and they're committed for 10 years. And it's not like you have to create content for 10 years to be successful, but that's what's required to be the best. Because if you don't have that, the people who are the top, they do have that. And that gives them an edge over you. So you have to be long term committed to this uh, and then just build a content strategy that is going to be sustainable for you, that removes friction. And then just do it and don't stop. Like, that's it. So many people, they start doing this and they give up after two weeks, a month, two months. 
because they're not seeing their business 10 X. It's like, dude, just stick with it for three to six, even three to six months. You'll be shocked at what happens when you're, when you start creating content and you do so in the right way. Um, but it has to be consistent. It has to be sustainable and just fucking stick with it. Don't give up after a week, two weeks, which is what almost everyone does. The irony is that a lot of entrepreneurs should notice intuitively, like, you know, a business won't grow overnight. You're not going to get to eight figures unless it's a fucking blue moon, like, you know, completely out of the, out of the, out of the ocean, right? It's going to be something completely different, but most people will, they just overestimate what they can do in a month and underestimate what they can do in, in a decade, in that instance. I like your aspect of removing the friction because I, I have found even with podcasts, right, that people will, they'll play like the scapegoat saying, oh, guests are so difficult to get and I have to do all this outreach and it's so awkward, whatever. But at the same time, they could just do a bunch of solo episodes, right? And then either use something like GPT to generate the questions. So put in your client avatar, put in the problems, put in the people that you help and then ask them to like scrape the 10, 20 biggest FAQ questions, right? That could be a good starting point for you. And we've done that for some of our clients and it's worked incredibly well. They've got great questions to go in and do solo episodes as a result. But you made a good point about the performance, right? And this is why I want to get your thoughts on this. Um, the talking head videos that are very intentional, like, like I look into my camera now and I write, I record a 30 second video on like how to grow your podcast. It's more intentional, right? How do you think about that compared to like a podcast whereby it's split and it's a bit kind of broken and the hook isn't as good. Do you ever struggle with stuff like this when you're, when you're cutting it down and making it into super viral? Yeah, it's a great question and talking point. Like with the podcast specifically, I like to think in terms of when I'm creating content of how this is going to turn into a short form clip. So when you're recording, like let's say a mock podcast, for example, um, I do them myself for my own content. Uh, I'll have a team member ask me a question. And instead of immediately just responding to that question, I repeat it back to them thinking that this is going to be the hook of my video. So if they ask me like, um, how do you guarantee top creators 150 million views in 90 days? Instead of just directly going into the answer, I'll say how we guarantee top creators 150 million views in 90 days is, and then I'll go into answering it, right? So now my video and my clip has a hook. So if you're thinking in terms of what you're saying in the long form, turning in the short form clips, that can definitely help. Um, additionally, when it comes to what you mentioned of the talking head direct to camera content being more intentional, it absolutely is. Um, and what we have found across the board we talk to a lot of people in this space who, uh, many of which are very successful, have been creating content for three to 10 to 15 years. And almost everyone I've seen who's having the highest level of success with the direct to camera talking head content, they script out what they talk about. Um, so that comes down to now you have great copywriting and, and great script writing. Um, and it takes time to do that, um, honestly. So you need either great systems and frameworks in place, and you just have to be disciplined and committed and really prioritize it if you're going to be the one yourself to write the scripts for your own videos or go out and hire a copywriter and have a great framework and great system in place to where they can write the scripts for you. You can tweak it slightly. I always like the who, not how approach, right? Like, you know, Frank Sinatra didn't move his own pianos. Like go hire people who are experts at what they do uh, to, to do the things for you that are really going to move the needle. Um, so that is recommendation. The other way that you could do talking head content is by mapping out the hook of your video. And then if you have the expertise, um, and you're a good communicator, sometimes that's all that necessary, uh, is knowing the hook and you say that word for word, and then you just riff on whatever else you, that is that you want to say about that hook. Um, cause it's essentially the video topic for you. Right. But I do see best success when people fully script those videos. Um, and that's another bottleneck, right. Of fully script writing everything. It takes a lot more time per video to do that versus doing a podcast or a mock podcast, an hour of filming with no preparation or very little preparation can still turn into, you know, 30, 40 clips, depending on the episode and what's being talked about versus if you're going to get 30 to 40 scripted talking head videos, that's going to take many, many, many hours of like fully scripting it out, really thought into it. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of validation behind both strategies, right? It's just depending on where you're starting from, what you're committed to, uh, and then how much time dedication you want to put towards this. 
are you what components are you going to outsource versus what components are you going to do yourself? That's super interesting, man. Like there's everything works. It's just about what suits you best. So even looking at Hermosi, which I know you mentioned earlier, and I saw the, you you met him recently too. Like his approach was like month, it was like the first and the second of every month, just getting into his studio or just sitting down in his chair and then reading out any messages that he prompted himself or whatever, right? And he can just riff off it then because he's he's a he's a clear thinker. Whereas for someone else, that could be completely awkward, right? It's like what you can do consistently forever, effectively. Now, this is really cool, right? Because <clears throat> this focuses on inputs. The inputs are, you know, multiple accounts or even your own account initially different ways to create content. But then the outcome is obviously multifactorial, right? There's some people that get great success, some people not so great success, some people get no success when they're creating some content. What do you think are some of the common factors, the common traits of like the top creators with the best results? Yeah, Mimin is a huge part of it. Going back to what I said, like people who really do this well, they get in and they're like, I'm just going to do this and not stop. Or I'm going to do this for the next 10 years. You know, so they're, they're long-term committed to making it happen. Secondly, understanding psychology. Like you, you truly should understand human psychology and just why people pay attention to the things they do. Understand cognitive biases, study marketing, like study what works. It helps a lot. Um, and also when it comes to studying what works, you can make a list. This is something that we recommend. Uh, we do this ourselves when we're launching with new clients. And then also in our coaching program, go make a list of the top 20 accounts and channels who have the audiences or similar audiences to what you're looking to build and study their content. Like look at it, go and look at their top performing stuff that is the outlier post that have performed way above average and reverse engineer. Why did this work? Like what's being talked about? What does the content include itself? Like what are the patterns behind these? And then you can do the opposite and look at the bottom performing stuff that's performed below average and reverse engineer that. What's being talked about there? What are the patterns? Why did this not work? So you can lean into what's working and lean away from what's not. And that helps you now start creating your content with a place of data of what's already working versus just winging it and trying to figure it out. And there's so many people, they, when they start wanting to create content, they'll just, they'll schedule some time in their calendar and be like, all right, they'll get there and be like, okay, so what do we talk about? And they just start like winging it and, and thinking of different ideas, like put some preparation into it. Uh, like study what's already been uh, performed incredibly well. It's already gone viral for other people and then take that and make it your own, right? That can really, really help. Um, and then when you have the right systems and you start to put more resource and team behind this, that can help significantly. Uh, so if you're just getting started, then yes, uh, you can be a little bit scrappy and you can wear more hats and, and take on more of your own. But also when you have the right systems, it really doesn't take a lot to outsource this and have a team to help you scale. Um, with our coaching program, uh, we help people go out and give them our recruitment systems to hire an editor, hire a social media manager, and you can outsource this and have incredible edit edited content that's being posted for you, omnipresent across platforms for a thousand to two thousand a month if you do this right and you follow the processes. So it doesn't take significant amount of money to to make this work either. Um, and most people, if they've had any level of success selling something that you can afford it, and it doesn't take a lot of views to really move the needle. Um, it just takes getting in front of the right people and having the right views in your content. So that's a big focal point that we really touch on as well Is like, it depends on your goal. If, if you're more so in the influencer space or creator space, it is more about vanity metrics and you're just trying to get as much views, as much followers as possible. But if you have a business, if you have an offer to sell, it doesn't matter about how many views you get. You just need to get in front of the, you just need the right views, right? And so what we talk about is you need to create all of your content speaking directly to your client avatar, your ICP, your ideal customer, your ideal client profile. Um, just get very clear on who that is. And then all of your content, the gut check should be, is my ICP, is my client avatar going to receive value from this? Yes or no? If the answer is no, don't create that. Don't post it. Like the answer should be yes in everything that you do. And at this point, the algorithm across all the platforms, it's so advanced. Like the, every platform has so much data on us. They know us better than we know ourselves, right? And so it knows what we watch, what we're into, what are our interests, what do we not like, so on and so forth. And if you're speaking to your ideal client, your ICP, 
the, the algorithm is going to serve your content to them as a result because it knows exactly who your ICP is and who you're speaking to in your content. It's just like when you run ads, so many people run ads with like broad targeting campaigns because the pixels on the advertising platforms are so good at this point. It just very quickly understands who to put your content in front of. Same thing happens organically, not quite as targeted, but it still happens. So if you're creating content consistently for your ideal cost customer and profile, you will get in front of them. Um, and then when you're consistent with it, all it takes is for those outlier videos to hit. You can have one video that snowballs your account and you gain a thousand, 10,000. We've even had videos gain us like 50,000 followers plus overnight, literally on an account. Um, and so that's what you're looking for to really tap into that exponential growth. Yeah, man. I, that's kind of what happened even to my account to some degree. We have a couple of videos that are like 27 million, a couple that are a few hundred million views, which have added thousands of subscribers or tens of thousands of subscribers as a result. And then it's all the other stuff that supports it. So my question for you of that is like, for people that do like long form, short form, have you seen that there's much attrition from short form into long form? Are you an entrepreneur who wants to build your influence and authority online? You may have tried some of the hacks and tricks, but none of it has worked. And it makes sense. 90% of podcasts don't make it to episode three. Of the 10% that are left, 90% of them don't make it to episode 20. That's where Voix comes in. Voix creates, manages, and grows your podcast for you on your behalf. If you've not been getting leads, not been growing consistently, you haven't found your tribe, and you don't know what to do, Voix is the answer. Don't just take our word for it. In the past couple of years, we've managed over 35 podcasts. We've also been able to generate over 55 million views with 500 episodes produced. And not only that, generating over $1 million for our clients in products, services, and sponsorships. So if you want to learn more about how you can build a great podcast and have it fully managed for you, schedule a call with me at Voix and we will help you achieve your podcast goals. Yeah, absolutely. And it does help if you follow strategic methods of making that throughput happen as well. So like with our content, we incorporate um, in a lot of our edits, we'll have like watermarks and handles of our client. And so I use podcasts, for example. Uh, one of our clients is Dropouts Podcast. In our content we create for them, um, most of it will have like Dropouts Podcast episode 156 right? As like a watermark and showing in different pieces throughout the, the content. And if we don't have that, we notice that when a video will go viral, gain a lot of views and traction, multiple people would be like commenting, what podcast is this? What episode is this? So like people will search it out and you can look at the short form as like movie trailers for your long form, right? And if it's good enough, it's valuable enough. People will want to go from the short form to the long form. So you can do that with edits. We do uh, call to actions in our content as well. Inside of the editing, we'll have like text and animation that comes up to like go follow or, or go to the YouTube channel, check out the full link content, things along those lines. You can also have call to actions incorporated in the captions of your post. Uh, you can use pinned comments. Pinned comments are so underrated. It's like caption number two. There's no rule of how many comments you can create and add to your post. Um, you can also incorporate it in the bios of your accounts, the links and bios, your stories. You should be using all the features of the platform on YouTube, like use community posts, just use everything that's available to you uh, to drive all that traffic back. But yes, if you're making it known that the short form piece of content is repurposed from long form, there's absolutely Passover in people that go to your long form as a result. Man, this is so valuable. I have to stop and actually say like, this is insanely valuable. It's so strategic. Like I know it's not like the lifestyle shit we're talking about, but this is like so strategic and so helpful for people. It's actually wild. I want to go through some of the <clears throat> framework. So you said, you know, speaking on point with the, um, with the ICP. I've also saw you mention even from the viral framework that you have, it's you want some bit of variety, right? And you brought, you brought into like health, wealth, relationships. These are like the bigger categories, which break down into the subcategories. Um, and then when I cross-checked it with some of your like hook frameworks that you have, some of the hook frameworks they're not super, super specific. They're kind of a little bit broader. I was kind of slightly surprised by that. Can you kind of walk through that kind of um, concept of like variety and content and when to go narrow and when to go broad? I like following the 80 20 rule. You know, Pareto principle is it's, it's proven, it's foundational. So if 80% of your content is really focused on speaking to your ICP, your ideal client profile, the other 20% can be more broad and, and mass approach. However, 
I also think a lot of people make the mistake to where, let's say from a business sense, you're an expert, like people can categorize me as an expert when it comes to content, right? But in, in my, my videos, I don't only talk about content because what I've learned is my ideal client profile, they're business owners. They don't just care about content. And I have a lot more expertise than that. I really know what I'm doing when it comes to sales. I know what I'm doing when it comes to marketing, to team building, to recruiting, to hiring, to operations. Um, so talking about those different components also still adds a lot of value to the ideal client profile. And on top of that, uh, when you know your customer well enough as well, you can talk on things that one, make you who you are. So for me, I like different components. I like working out. I like traveling. I like, you know, nice dinners. Um, I'm about to be married. I have a fiance. Uh, I'm like more traditional family focused. I'm here for longevity, legacy, build an empire. So talking on different components like that as well, like my ideal client profile is someone who also matches those values, right? That's very values oriented. So I, I like talking and building an audience and resonating with people who also like that, you know, and, and want to go out, like become married, like build an empire, like think, think long-term with things. And so, um, it doesn't have, you don't have to bucket yourself in only one arena. You can get creative and match different topics, uh, different values, different beliefs and components that you speak on in your content. That's still going to attract the right audience that you're wanting to build. Right. So, um, still make yourself a person like you can, you can and should create additional content outside of only your offer or only your business that builds more of that relationship with your audience and your viewers. Uh, it makes you more of a person. Also something that you can and should do, uh, with our done for you services, all of our clients, we have them, uh, do what's called, we call it a camera roll dump to where they'll create a shared photo album and go through and then just put together all the, the pictures and videos of anything and everything they're willing to share of them with family and friends and colleagues and travel and hobbies and so on and so forth, like behind the scenes content, uh, a lot of story-based content. And then we can use that to put inside of our edits and use this B-roll. And it builds more of a personal relationship with the viewers. Like we've had so many of our clients do this now. And when I look through these photo albums they put together, I really feel like I get to know them as a person, like on a personal level, like I see them with their family, their parents or their kids and just doing whatever their friends. And it's like it, in a, in a weird way, you just, you feel, feel like you really get to know them. So when you incorporate that in your content, the same thing happens with the people who are in your content. They feel like they get to know you on a more personal level. Plus it gives you better B roll uh, that you can then customize. And the more congruent it is with what you're talking about, the better as well. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can and should incorporate who you are as a person into your content as well, uh, which builds more of that personal brand. Like people want to know the human, uh, behind the expertise and behind the business. Man, I like that because I think we, as like entrepreneurs, you get caught up in like, oh, the offer, it should be business focused. It should be ROI driven. And there's a lot of guys that are saying you should do that. And like, and you know, there's, it's like everything works, right? Like that works to make like money, right? That, that gets leads, it gets business. And then just there's the other side of it then, which can be <clears throat> more showing who you are, your personality, which wor which also works, right? So it's kind of like testing these models for yourself and incorporating a combination of both. Because even from watching your content, I started doing more stuff like that. Even like we produce a lot of clips of just me, but we started doing more overlays with, you know, videos of B-roll of me before a podcast. It could be meeting, you know, Luke Belmar, Sterling Cooper could be meeting whoever, right? But meeting these people and then incorporating that is a part of like my kind of like value system as a result. And it works much more effectively. You made a good point with the photo dump and I'm going to do that right after this, this, this podcast. I take, I, I don't, I don't take this lightly, man. I'm, I'm really actioning on this and I'm not, so I'm thinking so much about this. It's cool to, for you to say, that you look at the photo dumps and you already emotionally connect because that's the whole objective. You, you can connect emotionally by just by just looking at a Google Drive that's probably not even sorted in the right fashion. It's probably all over the place, right? <laughs> that you can connect emotionally with that, which just shows that that's what people resonate with to begin with. Yeah, yeah, it helps a lot. And then if you have um, like a girlfriend, boyfriend, partner, whoever, like for me, my fiance, she has so much content of me as well. So they also, if you have that, like go through their camera roll also and create that shared album, like get more content of you also going out. 
it definitely helps. Cool, man. So yeah, tell me more about that because I actually wanted to ask you about that. So on your personal side, you know, you're growing this company. It's probably, it's fucking, it, it, does, it doesn't seem like it's easy, but you know, you, you very level ahead with doing it. But on the personal side, like you mentioned, you're getting, you're engaged, you're getting married soon. Um, like what's the plan there on that side? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's going great. Our wedding is coming up in June. Uh, we're doing a destination wedding. I'm based in LA. Uh, and then we're getting married in Paris. We got like the incredible Chateau. So it's going to be awesome. Um, but it, wedding is, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it, man. It's, it's a, it's a lot. There's so many moving pieces and there's especially different time zones where like, you know, waking up earlier, like doing calls and there's, there's just, so many decision makers involved. You have your, we got wedding planners, which has been huge. Um, but my mindset with it is I was talking to someone who had already been married for like 15 years or so. And he was talking about how this is really one of the only times, if not the only time that all the people who you care about so much are going to be in the same space together. And it's just, it's a once in a lifetime event, you know? So I want to make it as best as it can possibly be. We have people literally flying overseas to be there to to be a part of that with us. So we're gonna bring the heat, bring the magic, and, and make it great. Uh, but yeah, it's you know going well. You balance that on top of everything else going on. But you just you make time for what's important. How do you find that like that balance between what you do in your relationship, what you do in your business, and what you even do in your personal life then between training and travel? I think this is a good talking point because it sounds like most of your audience is entrepreneurs or people who are aspiring entrepreneurs, uh, more business oriented. I truly believe it just does not work if you have a partner who is not also entrepreneurial. Like I, I just don't see a scenario because they just don't get it. They really don't. Like for I have I have a lot of people and friends who are in relationships and um, they do, it's just like one partner who doesn't have that. They're always wanting so much more time where they don't fully get it. They're wanting you to slow down. Um, Hermosi has a saying I like. It's like, you want to be broke, find a partner who doesn't, who makes you feel bad for working. You know? So for me, uh, my fiance, her name is Vanessa. She's also very entrepreneurial. She has um, multiple business ventures, a lot going on as well. Like we're both busy. Um, I think a lot of relationships, a lot of problems just come because one person doesn't have enough going on. It's like the person who doesn't have, who has like too much free time, they they make problems, right? Because they're like missing their partner or whatever. But when you're both busy, you're both focused, you have a lot going on. It's just, we're grateful coming together at the end of the day and spending a couple hours going to bed, repeat, make it happen, you know? Um, but you still also make time for going out, having dates, like travel, you know, doing the important things. Um, but it just, it naturally works. Like we don't have to force it. I don't feel like I have like systems in place or whatever, like have like expectations that I need to set. It's just for me, I had a very specific list of what I was looking for in a partner. I was open to it, but I wasn't seeking it. And an SOP. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, not an SOP, but I I'm huge on vision. Right. So I had on my vision, like I was looking for someone who was like, Loyal, health conscious, adventurous, supportive, fun, um, health oriented, some, so many different factors. And, uh, when I met Vanessa, she just checked all the boxes and it, it just kind of came up. Um, but I was very specific about what I was willing to do and what I was willing not to do. Um, and it's just worked naturally. Like she also works a lot. She has said, like, we had these conversations from the beginning. I think they're incredibly important. I let her know, like, I love work. I'm busy. I'm very work oriented. And that's a requirement for, for me. Like, I'm never going to give that up. I'm never going to sacrifice that. Um, and she's always been extremely supportive. It's like, I'm never going to ask you not to work, you know, outside of the important things. Um, so she just, she just knows, um, she grew up in a family of entrepreneur business owners. Like she knows what it takes and she knows the, the fruits, uh, to the reward that you get out of it as well. Right. So you just got to find the right person. And they have to also have that. They have to be business oriented entrepreneur themselves. Um, if that's how you are, that's truly in your blood, then I think it's a requirement or else it's just not going to work. Yeah, it's the exact same for me. Like my partner is American and her family are like entrepreneurs, you know, real like grungy old school entrepreneurs. Like the guy's like taking sales calls from the, uh, the phone boots kind of vibe. So she kind of like understands that. That's the reason why I asked is because like it's a similar value system. And even though we're different 
personality wise she's much more calm and, and tranquil and kind of have that ebb and flow she still understands like the end goal and like the cost and the sacrifice right and that's why for me it's like the business the relationship and health but then if we can't go somewhere we can't do something because like this is the core focus that's okay right because then the the benefit as a result, the long-term benefit, e.g. doing it for a decade, is much better, right? You have a better lifestyle, better foundation for everything you want in life. But again, the only problems that come from it is when you have the lack of purpose and drive, right? So when I was working, I used to work in tech companies and I was like really unfulfilled in that. And then as a result, to be honest, our relationship was probably worse because I was looking for other things to do. And similarly for her, we were traveling and she didn't really have a, like a role or a company or a business. And then it's only until we actually opened up a, like um, a charity that she kind of went into that whole full time, which is basically like a full time role. All right. So that's kind of like her endeavor. And then I have my endeavor. So it's like, we're both on a similar mission. I just feel like a lot of young guys will, either get in relationships in the, in the wrong vein, like people will, they're not on the same path or it's someone that's just looking for like an ROI, right? Basically like the guys are just, they're not thinking of a true long-term. They don't really understand what they want. So it's cool at like 26, you found like your life partner. Now you're building together and you're part of this like longevity legacy play. Yeah. And I'm look, I'm not saying that this is the right approach, like do whatever you want to do. Uh, you know, but I, I think, I think extremely long-term um, I've had, the privilege and uh, opportunity to, you know, work with a lot of extremely wealthy people. And that's something that I, I learned through them is like the, the wealthier, the more long-term they think. Um, and I, I'm thinking not just 10 years out, I'm thinking 50 years out, I'm thinking hundred years out, like where, where are things going to go? What are things going to look like on the most important life decisions, like career path, business opportunities, partnerships, um, your relationships, you know, marriage, no marriage, kids, no kids, like think long-term with these things. Don't just be wild and out and, uh, taking whatever comes in front of you. Um, I also think when it comes to relationships and, and this, not only just your romantic relationships, but your family, friends, business partnerships, the questions that you're most afraid to ask are the ones that are most important. Like ask those questions. Um, and I find a lot of time people are afraid to ask these important questions because they know it's like, if the question doesn't go the way they want it to, it's revealing to them. It's probably not the relationship that you're looking for. Right. But on the other side of that, it can be so fulfilling and rewarding because if they do answer the question in a way that what you're looking for, like, you know, you have your person, you know, you have your partner. So with me and Vanessa, um, we, we just had a lot of really important conversations and ask the hard questions early. Right. Um, and still do. Um, so we're just, we're both really great at communicating. Uh, we don't hold back. We, we ask the important questions. We talk through things like both of us look long-term. Um, and that's what gives me the confidence to marry her, to spend my life with her because we've talked about this so in depth, um, and just know what things are going to look like. We know where our, our alignment is, like our values, our beliefs, we're very aligned. So there's so many people, they don't think about that and they don't have these conversations. A lot of people are afraid to have these conversations, but it's necessary. Otherwise, you know, you could end up making big mistakes um, that don't come until years down the road. Yeah. So that's the whole, if that's, that goes back to time and effect, right? It's crazy. You have that long-term thinking, like, which is like frontal in your mind. Like it's like really focal in your mind. And that's, that's why it works so well for you, right? It's because you're willing to answer these questions now and look at these questions now versus most people are going to score in the circles. And that's when divorces come in, business partnerships break down. Like how many times do you see business partnerships break down, businesses dilute, not because of a lack of business or a lack of business or a lack of opportunity, but mainly just the relationship between the two people. Like, you know, what's most common is like one guy wants to like scale it another person wants to take it easy because they're having kids and everything, right? Like I've seen that so many times play over and over, but if you can be clear on what you want to do, it's going to be a lot easier to define the angle. And if you don't know the right questions to ask, there's just look it up. You know, there's a lot of resources as well that help prompt chat GBT. Like you mentioned earlier, you can use chat GBT for content ideas, like questions, like it's smart. You know, there's a, there's a lot of who to marry. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of amazing prompts out there, you know? So just like, just think through it. Um, but when it goes the last thing to touch on with the long-term thinking, I just, I, I haven't always been this way, but I just 
realized that it, that was such a congruent pattern with everyone who I really looked up to and be careful about who you look up to as well and who you take advice from, like only take advice from people who've done what you want to do. And more importantly, only look up to people um, in the arenas to where they've done what you want to do. Um, and you don't have to, you know, take pieces from people, but you don't have to emulate all of them. Like Steve Jobs, for example, amazing. You know, he built Apple. It's like one of the most incredible companies and brands of all time. Like he revolutionized technology. Um, and, but he's notorious for being an asshole, like, and just being an absolute dick to a lot of people who work with him. And so many people, they take that from him. It's like, I, I think he would have been more successful if he hadn't have been. And actually it's proven like that was him earlier on in his career and him being an asshole is why he got kicked out of Apple. And he kind of mellowed out and, and learned from that experience. He came back and he was not nearly to the degree like that later on in his career, which is when he really turned Apple around and it became what it is still today. Um, a lot of the values and, and beliefs there. So the moral of, of bringing this point up is just be careful about who you aspire to be. And you can still take a lot of inspiration and value from people in certain arenas, but don't follow them with everything. Right. And so, um, also look behind the curtains, like look behind the scenes. I meet a lot of people in the content space who have big followings. And, um, when you look behind the scenes, it's not, not everything is admirable. Right. And so only look for those admirable pieces, take value from that and then make it your own. Uh, but just be careful about who you take advice from and, and what you take advice about. That's the challenge of content, right? Is that you, you know, it can often be a smoke, a smoke, a smoke mirror if it's not going to be done properly and done effectively. So you're seeing the wrong variation of someone. Now, that's not to say that there's nothing wrong with the individual because that's better to take small segments from people and also get your information from other people, right? You mentioned like jobs. You kind of want to look back in history and look at some of the biggest leaders, the best inventors, the best creators, the best artists, instead of people that are like, last two years on Twitter have grown an account, right? Like what, what do we know? Like we're just kids, right? You get me that there needs to be that broader level of learning, like re-education, you know, you mentioned courses and everything, just constantly learning going forward. Otherwise you're just going in circles. You can't take from both, right? Like depending on, I, I heard this early on and it really resonated with me of when you're looking to scale a lot of the time, like, yes, you can learn a lot from people who are at the, the extreme top, let's say in the business arena, like, learning from Elon, learning from Steve Jobs, learning from Bezos, like people who have the top point zero 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 one percent But so much of what they do and focus on as well may not be applicable to you in a lot of ways when you're just getting started. And so another great mentor for you is someone who's literally right above you, right? Let's, let's say that you're making 2000 a month, learn from someone who's making 10,000 a month. And then when you make 10,000 a month, learn from someone who's making a hundred thousand a month, like take those steps right above you um, and continue to follow a process like that as well. But also you should learn the foundational knowledge, the principles and the people also at the top. But, uh, the, and then you're never, you're never too far along, right? I still meet people who they, they may not have a bigger business than me, but they have different areas of expertise that's working incredibly well from them. Like you can still learn from that. Um, so don't, don't like close your eyes off and have tunnel vision and only think that you can only learn from people who are further along than you or, or much further along with, than you. Um, there's still so much to learn from people who are earlier on in the stages, but have different strengths um, and different expert knowledge in, in areas that you may not. You can always learn from anyone, right? You can, you can take something from everyone. And that's why I asked you about, you know, marriage and relationships because, you know, wealth, wealth is in the mind and wealth is multifactorial. There's the business, there's the finances, but there's also freedom, there's relationships, there's health, there's your training, there's your nutrition. There's different variables. And a lot of times you're pulling from people that may be behind you or side you or sideways or whatever, but that's where you're getting a lot of the lessons from. Um, and man, that's the, that's the forever learner, right? It's not looking at the world through the guru lens. Like that's my big kind of issue sometimes with like online world is that people determine like their view as, as the view, like the, this is the ultimate, um, view on like everything. Whereas having a student of perspective, which is the whole idea behind my podcast for four years, 200 episodes in, is that regardless if it's short form, long form, copy, whatever, we're always learning different variables. And I think with a second you stop actively learning is actually when you start regressing in your business as an individual, the ego starts elevating. Um, and yeah, man, that's why I always wanna keep like this kind of approach in, which is like, no matter how busy I am, we're putting out episodes every single week because we're learning and, and we're teaching other people, right? Probably similar to you, the feedback you probably get in your content is people 
wanting to start or they're young and you don't you don't even know the impact you can have on someone with putting out some of this content. That's why this was super tactical, but super effective. Amazing. I've enjoyed it. I appreciate you having me on. It's been uh, a fun conversation. You know, it took you down a different route arena than some of the other podcasts I've done. So it's been fun. That's the idea, man. Now, what's funny is like a lot of the tactics for you are, they're so important to share and they're so important to the story, but I wanted to go down a different view and I feel I would love to do a second version, a uh, second episode as well in uh, in LA, uh, get a nice studio booked out and do it, do it, do it in person, man, because there's so much, there's so much involved in your business that that can go down that path, right? But yeah, man, in the meantime, I want to say massive thank you. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. It's, uh, it's been awesome. And then for anyone who wants free value, like I mentioned, you can go check out mediascaling.com forward slash secrets or 2 billion B secrets course. And if you want a really, really high converting lead magnet, like model or page exactly, I've created hundreds of funnels. That funnel is the highest converting I've ever seen by far. And we've, uh, I didn't learn this myself. One of our clients was doing it and it's just plain white background, headline, sub headline button. Like that's it. I've split tested it against BSL and sales pages and images and like all these different components that you think make it so much better. But when it comes to funnels, just like simpler, the better. So, um, extremely basic, take it. I mean, we're, we're helping other people implement that as well. And we're seeing that across the board of up to a three X in often rates, um, from modeling that funnel and landing page. So go check out two billion view secrets, uh, and then swipe that funnel model it for yourself. It just, it just works. It's crazy how effective it is. Yeah, man. I'm going to include that as well in the show notes and stuff, because it is so fucking valuable. Like I just, I had to find it last time. I know you mentioned it and I didn't see it. So I want to include it for people. Um, and I'll have it in audio. I'll have it on YouTube too. And yeah, man, anything else I can support you on? Just let me know. Yeah, likewise. I appreciate it.